Thank you for joining us for Still Speaking, a podcast from Ivanhoe Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. We are a United Church of Christ in Mundelein, Illinois, and an open and affirming congregation. This podcast aims to explore scripture through conversation with the purpose of discovering new insights and enhancing individual faith practices. God is still speaking, and we are all listening to discern a message for today and deepen our faith. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 76 of the Still Speaking podcast. Today, we're talking about perseverance with faith. You had a different way of phrasing that. Uh, persevering in faith. Persevering in faith. I like with. With is better. Really? Okay, good. How about number 76? That's like the best number, right? The best year to be born. Is it, it is because we were both born in 76. <laughs> Bicentennial babies, right? Yeah. I was thinking that too. That's so funny that you mentioned that. Um, so I'm Shelly Grow. I'm with Pastor Chris. We're going to have fun today talking about this. Um, it, what faith means to us and how we get through the hard times. Um, Pastor Chris, you challenged me to think about marathoning and the perseverance that is related to running a long distance race. Do you have any specific questions about that? So, um, it's it's a metaphor that's that's in our scripture reading, and it's something that I you know know uh, know know enough about to know that I'm ignorant about it. So I've never done that, and I know um, that it's uh, difficult. That it requires uh, perseverance. It requires a variety of um, practice and skill, and getting to the point where. Um, you know, what is it? Uh, you, you feel a wall coming. So like, uh, I've only ever run, you know, short distances and you feel like stopping. Mile 22 stop. is the wall. <laughs> so, um, imagine that we can get to mile 22 before we hit the wall, but, but it's a 26.2. So like, yeah. so somehow you have to get through that mm-hmm. and to continue. So uh, the image, so it, Obviously, I, I mean, the term marathon, right, comes from ancient Greece, I think. And, and so it must have been mm-hmm. carried through uh, uh, Roman culture and to our early church uh, friends. So um, so I'll pick it up with in terms of my understanding of it as an image for the church. But you tell me what it's like uh, personally. I'm I, My understanding is if somebody goes like your family has gone to support you, they, they pick certain spots, right? Yep. Because you can't you can't run along some watch oh, you can't watch a whole race right so you right. have to go to certain uh mar- mile markers mm-hmm. in order to cheer you on and you as the runner know your uh limits or where you would want them to show up right Absolutely. Where, you, where you need the cheering so yep. so tell me yeah so i i have run five marathons um in phoenix detroit and chicago and i have had people support me in every one of them um, and you're absolutely right where you pick the mile markers for support. So the first marathon I ran in Phoenix, um, there was a guy who I had been dating. He was a past boyfriend, but he was a cop and he was going to be at mile 20. And I asked him to have a cooler with um, an energy drink and a banana. So at mile 20, I hit that point and I knew I would not only have the sustenance of the energy drink with the electrolytes and the banana for the potassium and like carbs for energy, but also like I had somebody who I knew cared about me that I could like give a hug to and then keep running. Mm -hmm. That was pretty awesome. So that's really important in distance running. Um, Running a race is not just about the race itself. It's about the preparation for it, which takes months. I mean, three to six months to just like prepare your body for it. And so you learn a lot along the way about where your energy levels are, how to fuel yourself, how to carry forward. And um, my husband, oh my gosh, I think that maybe we'd been dating two months before I did the first Detroit marathon and my parents came into town for it and he was going to show them all the spots and he 
was like, I am the best marathon spectator. <laughs> and he was like, he made it his goal to be at every position. There are some spots on the racetrack where like they encourage fandom, but he also, you know, tried to, to be there at certain areas. Um, I've always asked my spectators can you have this set of socks for me? Because mm. at this point in the race, I'm going to need to change my socks wow. because of blisters, yeah. right? Like, or can you, um, you know, I, I'm going to need this or that. Can you hold this sign? Um, it it really takes internal fortitude and training and practice to be able to carry yourself through the distance. There is no way you can do this on your own. I have made lifelong friends that I've only met in person on the race course. Isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. Like there are people that I can call today and the only time I've seen them in person is because I was like at mile 17 and dying and they were like, hey, can I walk with you this mile? Mm -hmm. Because, um, because I need to rest and I can see that you need to rest. And so you like you you forge these um, connections with people because of what you're going through. And I suppose in our modern, you know, environment, life is life. And we we almost have to, like, create these experiences where where we're putting ourselves through extra effort um, that. Because we, you know, thank God we have not lived through a war in the United States in my existence, but we have relatives who are living through wars in another part of the country. Okay, long story short, um, marathoning takes a community. Absolutely love the support that we get along the way, and there are countless, countless analogies that we can put towards scripture in terms of how we build on community, how we go the distance. Um, where do you want to go from here? Like I, I could go in a, a million different directions. So I think we, we go into the scripture that has this image towards the end. And, awesome. Um, but we, um, you know, put that in the parking lot, put a pin in it that, that we're going to invite that later to think about those people who have been the support system Absolutely. and have helped us okay. on this journey of faith. So we're looking at Hebrews. Yeah. So we're at uh, towards the end of chapter 11. Then we'll have the first couple verses of verse 12. Um, most likely scholars say that this was a community in crisis, um, that they were being persecuted, whether um, they literally were being tortured and, and killed. I, I'm not certain. But what we do know is that it, re- it was a time of crisis that required the community to come together and to remember that they were not traveling alone. So, um, well, let's just invite that right now. Um, the people that you think about, the people who have been with you, um, perhaps you're going through something right now that you really need, um, help and to consider the tools, like you said, uh, the practice needed for perseverance. Look back, you know, when you've gotten through something difficult in life before, what helped you, what can you mm-hmm. rely on as a tool or do you need a new um, a new support system, a, a new person or uh, family members, uh, church friends that can give you that uh, referral to um, find the strength that you need to get through this difficult time. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but the Egyptians attempted to do so and were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled by seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They were about in skins of sheep and goat, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. 
yet they wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. What does this mean to you? So I think there's a a lot in it, but what it means to me, it it sounds like a sermon to me. Yeah. It sounds like, hey, these are hard times, but we're going to get through it. And let me call the roles, you know, go back, look at all these people, all the stories of our faith. These people went through difficult times and they got through. Yet for that time and place, when it's the early church and they're thinking about how they're following the way of Jesus, they're saying, but looked at all these things. This is how Jesus was God. This is how we experience God through Jesus, because it was something different. It was something better. And, and that's the gift that we've been given now, something even better. Um, and I really like the image of of that it's about togetherness, because like you were telling us about your individual running, you needed this community. And, and all this language is plural. And people usually don't run races. No, nobody runs a race side by side, right? It's uh, either a relay race or like you had your community of people that encouraged you. All of that was, um, we are running this race together and Jesus is going to give us this uh, strength. Um, and I think that's why you know, I like sports as a fan, but as a parent, you know, sports is is not about uh, championships. It's about young people learning teamwork and, and how to work together and how to get through um, these uh, situations that we create. Uh, you know, it's not a real problem in life. We're creating a challenge for them to uh, do their best. And, um, and I think that's what games and, you know, having fun at a family game night, whether it's a board game or kids out on uh, the lacrosse field, that's what it's about winning. It's it's not really the competition uh, of of winning a game. It's about uh, doing our best and, and bringing out the best in ourselves because nobody wants to bring out and accentuate the worst in ourselves. So. I don't know that I'd have really thought about it that way before, that um, student – or like youth sports are a way for kids in a safe space to test like basically their tenor, like to test their ability to make it through a difficult situation and win and lean on teammates and understand their place on the team. And like, wow, there are amazing life lessons that come out of that. I hope so. Um, I mean, oftentimes uh, you're looking at the, you know, parents that you're, don't want on your, you know, it's oftentimes, <laughs> sadly, a situation where we um, see the worst in our neighbors and community. And I, and I know I've been a part of that. And I, I need to repent and receive God's grace from the time I wasn't a, a good fan, but I no, try to do better. No, you're fine. You know what? We're on the different end of this. It's so funny because we're the same age. But your kid is grad, has graduated high school and is going into college. I have a kid starting kindergarten this year, so like we're on opposite ends of the spectrum. So you're looking retrospectively at like, oh man, did I set him up the right way? Like, how did all that play out? And I'm sitting here listening to your wisdom and thinking, okay, how do I set them up? Mm -hmm. What situations do I want to put them into to test them and to help them get a little bit stronger along the way in a safe way so that they've got confidence and they can build it and grow? Right on. All right. Okay, so in the the beginning, when when they're starting to kind of call the roles, I'm wondering if if you think this is like a a call and response thing. So I I found um, great... Uh, preacher, preaching professor Tom Long thinks that this is a, a call and response. So um, so it's uh, the preacher saying, and, and what more should I say? And the response, will you say this? Uh, tell it out, brother. Tell it all. Does that sound like a, a nice call and response? We don't do it a lot at, at our church. And, and so I say, call it out, brother. Yeah, yeah. 
so then the scripture says, but but we don't have enough time. Time wouldn't let me say it. And, and so the response comes back, no, no, say it all. No, brother, tell it all. So um, then he starts calling the roles. So I got to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. And and you would give me like an encouragement. Like yes, that. tell it all, brother, preach on. And I'd have to tell about those moments uh, when faith conquered kingdoms and shut up the lion's mouths and tell about women who were tortured and men who were mighty in war and children of God who were flogged in stone. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, that the world was not worthy of them all. Not worthy at all. No, no, not at all. So then comes the really dramatic moment. So we're setting up this litany. We're getting people's energy and excitement. And just as this parade of faith has nearly reached the church door, the drumbeat stops. The preacher halts or pauses, and the he stares out at the congregation and sweeps his arm in a backward moment as as if to wind his way back down the pathway that his words have just traveled, as, as if to gather them up in a single gesture, that whole assembly of faithful ancestors, and says slowly and deliberately these words. Yet all of these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised. And, and hopefully, if people have been listening or if the preachers set this up, people will be wondering, but, but why? why? But yeah, why? why? God provided something better. And the congregation mm. hopefully knows and the preacher means Jesus, that this better, um, Jesus better than the angels, better than hope, a better covenant, better promises sealed by a better sacrifice, that Jesus is something better, and that should come as no surprise that the faithful ancestor did not receive the promise until the coming of Jesus. And again, that's a way for us to articulate that what it is in our faith that we have seen God revealed in Jesus Christ. That's, that's you know, it's, it's nothing that's anti-Semitic or nothing saying that our Jewish friends are, are wrong. It's just, it's us saying We've seen the completion, the fulfillment of all of those promises that were offered to us in the Hebrew Scriptures have now come into their fulfillment, and that's what we believe Jesus is, God incarnate, bringing us the promise of all promises, the, the, the best of the better. Perseverance extends on. Right on. With every you know individual and generation that passes through. We've got quite a history here at Ivanhoe. Mm-hmm. Um, can you share some of that in terms of... Um, you know, all of the souls that have passed through these walls. So if if I was to, you know, call the litany, so we go back to um, the 16 adults who sat in a, a wood cabin not too far from here and said, we, we want to be a church together. That was February 20th, 1838, you know, the middle of a cold winter where a, mm. a pastor had to take a two days journey out from Chicago to pray with them and sign the official papers, making them to be a church and... Um, you know, thinking about what it would be like and what this community would look like. I think they first um, thought that would be better kind of in the Libertyville area. And then they thought, no, oh, out here, you know, this is going to be the hub central of uh, the community. So this building, um, our Ivanhoe Church building was dedicated December 10th, 1856. And uh, it got raised up a little and, and miniature mules dug out the basement a little and they had this, um, you know, multi-purpose room, fellowship hall, but not a kitchen yet. So the ladies okay. would have to bring their covered dishes and have them warm. And I think mm-hmm. then they got those electric roasters, but eventually um, built on the addition that included the kitchen and the education um, rooms like 100 years later. Just before that, they built the parsonage because they were going to close the church. My predecessor's predecessor was sent as the student pastor saying, um, this is the time to close this church. Oh, I didn't but, know that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the church office in Chicago um, said, you know, they're down to just a handful of good folks, and that's, you know, not a viable group. And he spent enough time and made enough uh, relationships, said, no, I can, I can help revive this church. And so from 1940, 50, you know, uh, brought his family out here. The, I think that parsonage was finished a year later. And within the next five, six years, they were able to add this addition on. Wow. Yeah. 
lots of good folks, um, and we need to give thanks for this gift that we've been able to inherit from them, passed on from generation to generation. Um, I'm so grateful for the effort yeah. they put in because, Gosh. because I can see what it's doing for the families today who are part of this congregation. Like, wow, if they hadn't fought for that. Right on. And, um, you know, just in, in my tenure, you know, lots of uh, mission projects. I mean, most notably our summer lunch program that we started nine years ago. I mean, uh, persevering through the pandemic and trying to bring worship. Um, I mean, you and I started this three years ago as mm-hmm. kind of a alternative to try to reach out to people. Um, but then two years ago, we literally had to figure out a way to bring worship to people's phones or screens or televisions and i mean in hindsight i would have to think that it was a little bit easier for us to transition because we had started to explore technology for the for the podcast yeah yeah and then made that commitment thank Um, you barry yeah now uh (laughs) and so many others who are now of the program a year after um whatever 14 months after um we've tried to regather but we continue to uh, you know, stream and record worship for people who, um, you know, whether their health is keeping them or their choices or they're on vacation or they want to catch up later. Um, yeah, I think it's a great gift and a way for us to try to be the church in, in exciting ways. Right. I love it. And there's so much more ways that we can explore that. So very exciting. So who I, uh, this, uh, you can answer it specifically or rhetorically, um, invite people to consider prayerfully who's in your great cloud of witnesses, you know, matriarch patriarchs, either of your church or your church family, or, you know, many church families along the way for people who move, um, you know, think about those people who have encouraged you think about those highs and lows and those times that you've overcome, uh, great obstacles or you've been on the mountaintop celebrating a, a wonderful achievement or a new insight and growth in faith and think about, um, perhaps those exciting, deeper, inspiring stories that that we can find a way to tell. Because, um, you know, there's times to have a, a warm feeling in your heart or a, a smile on your face from a memory, but, but so much better to be able to articulate that and to share that with people so that they can feel that same sense of inspiration. Absolutely. What are you thinking? Something you want to share? Um, I, well, I mean, just in general, I think that people um, might not always realize the ways that they impact others. Um, and so, you know, don't shy away. Like just your your presence in many small ways can make an impact on other people. So... A little vague, but just kind of, you know, putting that out there for people. Our um, UCC, um, there's a, a gathered group of, of writers and sometimes people submit things, but we, we have a, a UCC daily devotional. And this week, um, along with this scripture, uh, Vicki Kemper encouraged a, a couple things specifically. So we I made it kind of a general invitation, but she says, make a list of things you've done personally. You might begin and end with just getting out of bed this morning, and that's okay because for some of us, that's a huge leap of faith. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can also recognize times when it felt like obligation or desperation, but faith um, at work in you can not only inspire yourself, but others to live more deeply and generously. Um, Sometimes we look at these like great heroes of, of Scripture stories, Um, But it doesn't have to be rare or heroic. It's truly intrinsic, a part of everyone, because we are all made in the image of the divine. And so each of us has and can be this uh, great race runner, um, uh, a hero to ourselves, and hopefully through our example, uh, encouragement to others. Yeah, you, you don't actually have to train half a year to run 26 miles to know what perseverance is. Right now. There are so many people in our congregation who have um, overcome many more things than um, lactic acid buildup in your thighs at aisle 17 <laughs> or 22. <laughs> like, um, I'm so inspired by everybody around me who has sheltered and nurtured our family. Um 
And I don't know that in the moment people think like, oh, yeah, this is great. I'm being strong. Oh, yeah, this is God in me. But if you can look back for those who are listening to this podcast and think about where you've been in your life and those peak moments that come to mind where it's like that was hard. That took a little bit of extra oomph. And just know that God was with you. God is with you. And because of that, you are, you know, you're a God to somebody else. You you are embodying um, that love for somebody else. If, if perhaps you're uh, in a moment of crisis and need just a little bit more, I believe uh, three years ago, we discussed a, a different scripture this week that is Psalm 80, that is a lament, a prayer of restoration. And you should be able to to scroll back through the queue, I think it might be episode four. But if you need that type of prayer, please check that out. You know, we're we're highlighting um, opportunities that we've had to look back after a, a time of crisis. But if you're in that and you need that, please, um, you know, that's the great gift of of Scripture that it's so diverse that we have a variety of collection and um, in the Psalms, there's lots of those prayers available. And it might help you articulate what you need right now. Thank you for that. Yeah. You got some more words to share, I think. You got uh, something you want to say? Do we want to do this now? The yeah. This little tag on? Yeah. Uh, tags are awesome. Okay. This is a long tag. It's probably a couple minutes. Um, this is my last in-person podcast, unless we choose to do one when I come back. But I'm moving on Monday to another state. And, um, and so I wanted to share with everybody um, just a little bit about my faith journey and what Ivanhoe Church has meant to me. Darn it, you didn't bring me a tissue box. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give some highlights here. I'll probably go in, in further detail when we're in uh, service together. But I've been with Ivanhoe for four years now, and we've been doing this podcast for three. So I think that that's a good example of how quickly I found this to be a great place for my family and to have relationships. Um, But I was a very young mom when I came here. I was not young. (laughs) My children were young. I'm an old mom. (laughs) Stop laughing at me. (laughs) Um, But I had a friend who um, came. We were church shopping together, my friend Joanna and I. And we brought our babies here back in, gosh, I think it was 2018. Um, And I I was literally nursing a baby at the time and I had a toddler. And and we had gone to a few different churches in the area and we walked into this one. It's like when you're house hunting and you're like, you know what, I've been in a million houses. I'm going to know the one that feels right. And so, you know, over the course of my life, I'd been in a million churches and I knew what ones didn't feel right. And I walked into this one and I was like, oh okay, these people are real. Like, this feels good. So we came back. Um, I grew up in a in a really conservative Christian church. And um, and they're lovely people, and I, I, I don't mean any harm, but it was not the right place for me. And um, we were growing up learning that women had a role in the kitchen, um, but not at the altar. And so when I was a teenager, I was... I, I was winning awards doing forensics, you know, like speech, uh, reading and reciting poetry and, and poems and stuff in high school competitions. But I wasn't allowed to go up and read the scripture at church. And I really struggled so much, Chris, with this disconnect. Like I didn't understand why God had given me a talent that I couldn't share in a religious setting. What is that? What is that? I don't... I, I didn't understand how I had a voice in the world, but not in the church. I think I'm going to spend the rest of my life untangling that. It really, you know, people say like, what's your trauma? I'm going to spend a lot of time untangling that in my life. This has been a place where I have been able to find my voice. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, So I think that I came to Ivanhoe four years ago with a question of where is my place in religion? But I knew that I wanted my kids 
to have a church because I knew what values I wanted to instill in my children. And I knew what was happening in the world in 2016. I'm not going to go into specifics, but like you all know what was happening. And I was scared and I needed a base to like reinforce the, the values of love that I wanted my children to have. So I came to church for my children, not for me. And then you all opened up your arms and you showed me that Christians don't have to be stuffy. They don't have to be serious. They don't have to be oppressive. They can be real people who are working through real life problems and that love can be the basis for our relationship with God and each other. And so in that way, Ivan Ho helped me heal my relationship with church and build a bridge to have a deeper understanding of God. Um, you know, Andy and I, we're, we're real people. And some days we come here and we're dressed up and we're, you know, able to shake hands. And some days we come here and our kids' hair is in tangles and we've got coffee cups in our hands and we're we're just like <laughs> amazed that we made it in the door and every single time the people listening to this podcast and who come here on the weekends like they um everybody just smiled and said hey how are you and i think for the first time in my life i thought wow you actually care like you're not just asking that because it's sunday morning you're supposed to ask that like you actually care how we're doing and you actually don't care that, like, we're a little disheveled. Like, you actually want to meet us where we are and, and help us, you know, in our journey to be good people. Um, anyway, I just I just want to put that as a shout out because I think that in four and a half years that I've been here and that um, I came as someone who knew that church could be a good place but didn't quite believe it. And I'm leaving as someone who whole heartedly believes in the place of church and community in our families. And I want to carry that to another community and build that and, and, and make that be a safe place for people who maybe didn't know that church could be a safe place for them. It breaks my heart to even say that, but that's how a lot of people look at, like a lot of people don't believe that church is their safe place. But Ivanhoe healed that for me. So, um, what is church, Chris? We talk about that a lot in this podcast. And for me, it's community, but more importantly, it's a loving community. And we can go down a rabbit hole of what love is. But to me, love is accepting people for who they are, where they are in their life, and creating a safe place for them to grow. And I am grateful for Ivanhoe. Thank you. And I thank you for being willing to share that. Um, it's a great gift for me for you to articulate that and I know it will be for our community and I'm so thankful for you um, helping me and the church have the gift of this podcast for the last three years and um, I'm grateful so thank you for saying that uh, thank you for celebrating it and many blessings to you on life's journey back at you amen Thank you for joining us for this podcast from Ivanhoe Congregational Church. We hope you'll join us for worship on any Sunday morning at 10 a.m. You can find us on Facebook or visit our website at ivanhoechurch.org. That's I-V-A-N-H-O-E church dot O-R-G. We are an inclusive church in Mundelein, Illinois, living our faith with hope for tomorrow and celebrating our history dating back to 1838. We are strongly committed to social justice and responsible stewardship of God's creation. We extend God's extravagant welcome as revealed in Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We welcome all people to join our vibrant, diverse, and supportive faith community. Blessings to you with grace and peace.